the Lord. Thank you for that. It's amazing how the music matches the message. Before we get started, I need to read this card. Thanks to everyone for your thoughts and prayers over the last several months for my mom and our family. We are so blessed to be surrounded by Christians that believe in prayer. We love you all. Thanks for everything, Jim, Farrell, and Richard. You go through things in life and you have to realize that uh, people are still suffering. People are still going through times of sorrow and difficulty. And it's so easy to get caught up in what's going through your life to, to forget that other people need to be ministered to. And so we need to continue to pray for these families. All right, let's open our Bibles, if you have your Bible this morning, to the book of Philippians, chapter number 4. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter number 4. We'll just read a few verses here. Verse number 5. We'll start Philippians chapter 4. And verse number 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I want to preach on this passage here and some points from the chapter of Philippians, chapter number 4, along the lines of peace or panic. Peace or panic? We're living in a perilous time at this point, and I think that we need to come back to the Scriptures and kind of recalibrate and get some help from the Lord. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get into the message. Father, we thank you for the time we can assemble this morning. We thank you for the songs that magnify Jesus Christ. And Lord, we look forward to that day when you do come back to get us and to take us home. And Lord, until then, this life is a veil of tears, and we have to deal with tragedy and sorrow, and we have to go through things, and we pray, God, as we approach some things in our own country and our own world at this point, that you may help us to stay focused on you. We pray, God, that you might help us to get strength and balance from the Bible, that you might encourage us from the Scriptures, that we can please Jesus Christ, our Savior, the best way that we can. And God, I pray that you may bless the message, you may remove me, and you may speak through me, through your word, to help each and every person that's here this morning. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I think it's fair to say this morning, as a nation, we are in some unstable and unsecure times. Obviously, there's a tendency for people to panic. There's a tendency for people to freak out. And I will say this, the tendency to panic oftentimes is because our way of life gets threatened. And as blessed Americans with a lot of prosperity and comfort, it's easy for us to get a little bit shaky when we realize, you know, I might not be able to have my, you know, bowl of ice cream tomorrow night. Um, you know, when hurricanes come through sometimes, we deal with that here in Florida, and we have to go out and get the generators all ready and get the, the coolers and the freezers all ready and get ready for, for all that kind of thing and, and possibly having trees fall on your house and that, those kind of deals. Anytime you have a situation like that, it begins to take a pretty predictable, stable life, and it begins to shake it up. And the tendency, just human nature, is to get frazzled, is to get worried, is to get anxious, to get over-concerned. And that's kind of a fault of ours, but it's very, very easy to do. I'll say this, for those of you that are just, you know, chilling and taking it easy and ain't really worried about things, let's be a little more compassionate toward those who are a little freaky. 
I say that because some people, maybe they don't have the stability in Christ like you do. Some of you are just waiting for the next thing to take us on to heaven. I mean, you're ready to go. And you're not really bothered by it. And I will say this, as a Christian, the worst thing that can happen to you could be the best thing. Because whatever happens in this life just ushers us in to life eternal where we will be with Jesus Christ. So really for the believer in Christ, everything is going to be okay. However, we do have tragedies and we have problems. We have our way of life threatened. I'm not saying this morning not to be informed. I'm not saying don't plan and prepare. I'm not saying don't be cautious. I gave you some comments in my announcements about being cautious. I think you should. However, your mindset should still be balanced and focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a Christian, you should respond as a Christian should respond. And so I want us to hopefully get some help from biblical help, some biblical help, From this passage this morning, you'll notice that in verse number 6, he says, Be careful for nothing. The word careful, you just take it and flip it around, full of care. To be so full of care. I have a bad habit about telling people when I say goodbye or see you later, I'll say, take care. (laughs) Which is really against the Bible. You're not supposed to take care and be so full of care. I should say just, hey, don't worry about it. (laughs) See you later, don't worry about it. Um, But the idea is not to be consumed with care, to be consumed with worry, to be fretting, to be so anxious and over-worried about things that you, you drive yourself into a frenzy about whatever may come. Here's the thing. The truth of the matter is we don't know what tomorrow may bring any of us. We don't know what the next few minutes may bring for any of us. I think when we have things like this come into our life, we realize how fragile life really is. And it scares us. All of us are a step between death. It's one step between death. All of us. And so I think sometimes when these things happen, it begins to frazzle us. So I want us to look at this passage here and get a few things out of it. The first thing I want us to back up to in verse number 4, and I'll give you about four or five things. They're all one word, easy to remember. The first thing to do in order to have peace instead of panic is, here it is, verse number 4, rejoice. <laughs> People are like, preacher, you have lost your mind. Paul the Apostle said this over in 2 Corinthians 11. He said, I glory in infirmities. He said, for when I am weak, I am strong. And Paul made that statement having a thorn in the flesh and he had these problems in his life that he could not get the victory over and God would not remove them from him. But he said this, I've learned that God's grace is sufficient when I go through that. So then he kind of got this idea, well, when I go through a trouble, that means I'll get closer to the Lord. So he said, I take pleasure in infirmities. Now, that's a high level to be at. And I'm not condemning you if you're praying. By the way, you get sick, I'm going to pray for you to get well. If I get sick, I want you to pray for me to get better. The Bible says we should consider those that are, that are in affliction as being in the body with them. But Paul was at such a level to where he knew as bad as it got, he could still be close to Jesus Christ. So let's look at it this way. The Bible says, rejoice, verse number 4, in the Lord. Now that's the key. Rejoice in the Lord. So I'm going to rejoice as I watch the news broadcast. You're probably going to get frightened or scared or they're going to drive you crazy. Be informed, but let's do it in moderation. (laughs) Have you made a trip to the grocery store yet? (laughs) Who still has hand sanitizer? (laughs) Rejoice in the Lord. You can't always rejoice in the country. You can't always rejoice in the state. You can't always rejoice in everything your family's doing. You can't always rejoice in the job that you work at. You can't always rejoice in things in the earth, but you can rejoice in the Lord. Because Jesus Christ never changes. 
He is someone we can sing about, we can talk good about, we can lift up, we can brag about Him, we can boast about Christ Jesus, we can reflect on how good He's been to us, we can reflect on how good He is, we can think about all the great things He has laid up in store for us in heaven one day, we can rejoice in all of that. He says rejoice. This is good therapy for you. Peace or panic, number one, rejoice. The circumstances of Paul writing this, he was in jail when he wrote the letter to the Philippians. That's the circumstances. He's writing from a jail cell, being persecuted for being a preacher back here in the first century. The circumstances, but notice the concentration is in the Lord. Corey Ten Boom was a survivor of the Holocaust, the Nazi concentration camp. Uh, she was, uh, her and her family was put into the camps because they harbored and safeguarded some Jews. And her sister, she lost her sister through the whole ordeal. And she's went around years after this and she gave testimonies and things like that. But she made this statement about... Um, telling people about how God was in the midst of unspeakable evil. We're not talking about just bad things happening. We're talking about people purposefully doing bad things. It's one thing to have something bad happen, but when you have something bad happening because of people, that puts a whole other perspective on it. Then how do you respond? She made this statement. She said, with Jesus, the worst may come. But the best remains. Jesus Christ is the fairest of the fairest. Jesus Christ is the best of the best. Jesus Christ is the best. He should be the greatest thing, I should say thing, not in any disrespect. He should be the greatest person in your life. You are to worship the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, all thy strength. If everything else crumbles and caves and falls, Jesus Christ still remains. He's the best. Rejoice in the Lord. It's a command. Notice it's not a suggestion. It doesn't say rejoice if you feel good. Rejoice if you're emotionally stable. Rejoice if everything is going well and you're healthy and wealthy and wise. It simply is a command. Rejoice in the Lord always. We sing that song sometimes. Count your many blessings and name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings. Rejoice in the Lord. You say, that's hard to do. Sometimes it's a sacrifice. You see, when we talk about worship, we move from doing things for Christ because it's convenient to doing things for Christ because it's sacrificial. And sometimes, as the Bible says, in everything give thanks and also being thankful for all things. Sometimes it's hard to rejoice and be thankful and therefore, it becomes a sacrifice. And if you say, okay, Lord, I'm going to thank you for this. Lord, I'm going to rejoice. Just take the step and see what happens. Take a hymn book out and get some hymns. And just in your own privacy, just start singing those hymns about Christ. It will help you. It will help to bring peace instead of panic. Number two, look down in verse number six. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Number one, rejoice. Number two, relax. Relax. Just take a chill pill. No, no, not literally. <laughs> some of you probably have some that will help you chill. Um, just relax. Relax. So preacher, how can you say that? Look at the text. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer. Notice he tells us how. You can relax by requesting. Now you can't take one without the other. Here's what Christians do. They try to say, okay, I want to take the biblical advice, but they only take part of the biblical advice. The biblical advice is rejoice in the Lord, okay, 
I'm going to rejoice in the Lord, but then he says, be careful for nothing. Okay, how do you just not worry about everything? How, do you, how can you relax? You have to read the rest of the verse. Be careful for nothing but by prayer. Be careful for nothing but pray about everything. We should be people of prayer. You get in the car, going on the road, how, much, how many times do we do this? I don't even think about it. I just jump in, switch it, turn it on, get in the car, get on the road. I, unless I'm going on a big trip. But really, the crazy people in our county, we ought to be praying going from point A to point B. Amen? <laughs> Lord, protect me as I get out, in the county, out here in Jefferson County. But we don't think about that, but we should be people of prayer. We should pray about everything. Pray as if everything depends on God. Act as if everything depends on you. That's good advice. The things that you can do, do them. Lord, I really pray. Lord, please help me to learn the Bible. The Lord says, okay, start reading it. <laughs> oh, you mean I have to do something? Yeah, you prayed about it, now you've got to do something about it. But he says, be careful for nothing. Okay, relax. Preacher, how do I relax? Pray about it. Take it to the Lord in prayer. We're so busy, and here's what I want to say about uh, some of this, this stuff, and I'm not a medical doctor. Don't come to me with your prescriptions. The only prescription I have is in a King James Bible, okay? I deal with spiritual matters. I'm not a doctor. But I will say this. Too many Christians run to the physical doctor before they go to Dr. Jesus. When you deal with Emotional problems, a lot of times it is a spiritual problem. And as a Christian, you need to take the spiritual prescription first. There are Christians that won't even pray about things. And they will just be consumed about those things. And they will worry and they will fret. And they begin to talk about everybody. They talk to every, every time you get around them, they just go on on and on and on and on about their problem, about their thing. They can't keep their mouth shut. They talk to everybody except Jesus. Amen. The Bible says relax, but request. You've got to talk to the Lord about it. If you're not talking to the Lord about it, you're not going to be able to have peace. Because that's the formula. I'm kind of an analytical person. I like to see A equals B and B equals C. If that's the case, why don't we need the alphabet? But anyway, this equals this. If you add this and this, this is the outcome. He tells us, don't worry about anything. But then he says, pray about everything. If you take the pray about everything out, you can't have the peace. Right. Say, so, preacher, I want to relax. Okay, you need to request. You need to rejoice. Notice how these things are connected in verse number 6. He says, but in everything by prayer and supplication. To, uh, supplication is like the word supply. You're asking for God to supply a need. Prayers is in general. When you pray to God, you're talking to God. You could be talking to God about anything. But supplication, there's a specific need you have. Lord, I'm having a problem with such and such. Be specific when you pray. But notice also supplication with thanksgiving. So when you come to God, you should have at least something that you thank God for when you pray. It's not just, Lord, I've got this big long list. I need you to answer this. And I've got this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem. There ought to be somewhere in that to where you talk to God, you thank God for some blessing that you have in your life. Amen. So rejoicing and requesting help you to relax. Our English word worry is derived from an old German word, vergen. It means to choke. That's a pretty apt description of worrying. Mental strangulation. It, it chokes you out. The Bible speaks about the Word of God growing up in the, in the soil, and some of it comes up and the weeds come in, and the Bible says they choke out. Kind of like when you have a garden, you have to get out there and you have to weed. You have to get the weeds out so they don't take all the nutrients. Some of you are so consumed with things, your spiritual life is being strangled out because of worry. You say, what are you telling me? I'm telling you to relax. 
But I'm not telling you to relax without request. You must take it to the Lord. I can tell you what. If you go to the Lord with a problem and you spend time in prayer, you might not see the answer when you get off of your knees, but I'm telling you, you'll feel better. Sometimes it does help to talk to someone. Amen? You, you just need to get it off your chest. And it does help to, to talk, to verbalize some things. When you pray, talk to the Lord. I want to encourage you, I know, don't do this driving down the road, you know. Bow your head, close your eyes, going down the road. If you pray driving down the road, keep your eyes on the road. Amen. <laughs> but when you take time to talk to the Lord, pray out loud. Pray out loud. You don't have to, you know, shout. You know, you go to a restaurant and eat. Lord, we thank Thee for this food. These heathen around us will not pray, so I'm praying. <laughs> no, I'm not telling you to do that. But when you talk out loud in your prayer, I mean, you can just whisper, okay, Lord, I, I've got this need. Lord, I need you to help me with it. Talk out loud because it will help you to stay focused. The devil will get in your mind. So pray. Preacher, how can you tell me relax? I'm telling you to relax by requesting. There are some jigsaw Christians. Every time they're faced with a problem, they go to pieces. That's what you call them jigsaw Christians. Amen? That worry is like a thin stream of fear. That worry trickles through the mind. You ever see what a stream can do? Sometimes you see dried up stream beds. You ever fly out west and you're flying over and you're looking down and you're seeing these just dried up stream beds all over the place? Boy, when the rains begin to come, those stream beds, they, they, they start out as a little trickle and they get more and more and then they get deeper and deeper and they get wider and wider. And next thing you know, it's a river that you, can't, you step in it, you're going down it. And that's how worry starts off. It starts off this little bitty thing. I was mentioning it in Sunday school. It talks about the people over there in Acts 14. They stirred up the people. They got them all wound up. They just kept talking about it and talking about it and talking about it and bringing in this opinion, that opinion. They stirred it up. You can be stirred up with worry and it can consume you. So you need to counterbalance that with the Scriptures. You need to be stirred up by the Spirit of God Number one, let's pray about it. So how can I quit worrying about it? you got to pray about it. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Joseph Scriven, the hymn writer, said, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. You know, as believers, we have peace with God, but we need the peace of God of God. Amen. When you trusted Christ as your personal Savior, He gave you peace with God. My sins have been forgiven. God is not my enemy anymore. I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven. I have peace with God. But when you go through trials, when you go through tragedies, when you go through emergency situations, you need the peace of God. A calm in the middle of the storm. Like those submarines, how they go and they get down on the bottom, the calm of the sea. They go down to the bottom and this, this storm can be raging up top. But they're down there on the bottom of the sea. Can't even tell anything's going on. Everything's just peace. God can give you that peace. How do we get there? We move from being consumed to being carefree. From being consumed to carefree. And it starts in the heart. You've got to be serious about taking everything to God in prayer. Rejoice, relax. If you don't, you're going to be consumed with panic. Uh, this, kind of like our city, they plant trees and things like this. particular city, they had these trees kind of going down the center of the, uh, the, the walkway. They had them planted ever so many feet and so forth. And they've been growing for years. And they noticed that there were two or three trees that were just dying out. And they com completely died. And all the other trees were fine. It's like two or three right there together. And people are trying to figure out what in the world killed these trees. Come to find out there was a gas line going underneath the city that had a leak. And it began to poison the root system. And so what happens with worry in your heart and in your mind, you get poisoned on the inside. And that thing begins to affect how you think 
and how you act and how you react. A lot of times as Christians, we're just reactionary. We wait until everything's happened to try to react to it. Instead, you ever notice Jesus Christ was very busy? We talk about being busy nowadays, and everybody is busy. Jesus Christ, for three and a half years, didn't even have a place to sleep. He traveled from city to city to city to city, preaching and ministering. But he was always calm as a cucumber. He had peace. Because he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was in fellowship with God. And if you're in fellowship with God, even if the whole world blows to pieces, everything's okay. I've read the end of the book. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There'll be no more sorrow, no more death. Neither shall there be any more pain. It's all going to be okay. Relax. (coughs) Notice in verse number 8. Rejoice, relax, and here's three in one. Verse number eight. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Here's three in one. Reflect, replace, redirect. Reflect. Notice in verse number seven. He says, the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your what? Your hearts and minds. That has to do with your intellect and it has to do with your emotions and your will. Your minds, he says. So in the next verse, he tells you what to think. Say, is is that possible? Yeah, that's very possible. Verse number 8, finally, brethren, he tells you. Just like he told you in verse number 4, and he told me in verse number 4, rejoice always. Just like he told us in verse 6, relax. Now he's telling us to reflect. You should think about certain things. Now have you ever, and I'm sure you do this when your mind gets to racing or you go through whatever, uh, except when you you fall asleep and you dream, then your, your mind never shuts off. It's always running. It's always moving. The thing is you have to reflect on the right things Or you have to redirect those thoughts to the right places. Reflect, redirect. You can't think two things at one time. The number eight, 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 the number eight. What are you thinking about? The number eight, eight. Try to start thinking of a different number and then you have to go back and forth. Your mind is set in such a fashion. So the scriptures tell us about the peace of God. It keeps our hearts, but it also keeps our minds because the battlefield is between the ears. He says over in 2 Corinthians, we need to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Some people you think, man, they're just the nicest people. You just don't hear what they're saying in their head. They smile at you with their mouth, but they're cursing you with their heart. Now, I don't want them to say always what they think. Well, if you think it, you might as well say it. No, that's not good advice. Just because you thought it, don't say You say, well, you know, I don't curse, and I don't, I don't give people the Hawaiian good luck sign, you know, the, um, the middle finger thing. Um, yeah, but you're saying certain things about that driver in front of you. You're thinking certain things about that, you know, uh, unintelligent driver in front of you. <laughs> Look at that unintelligent automobile operator. <laughs> That's not the language and the verbiage that you use. Now, you might not use the expletives that some of the people out in the world use, but you're thinking them. Or you're thinking harshly. The Bible speaks of covetousness, being idolatry. Covetousness, wanting something that's not yours. There are all kind of thoughts that go through our heads and we go through scenarios when we deal with panic and we deal with tragedy and we deal with situations. We start running scenarios and we try to find out how we can protect ourselves or how we can help ourselves and we begin to just focus on us and selfishness and we get our minds in all kind of places. I'm telling you, sometimes even the guilt monkey will jump on you. The Bible says, If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. 
Reflect, replace, redirect. He says, think on these things. Mind mending, verse number 7. We need our minds washed. You say, you believe in brainwashing. Absolutely. Brainwashing with the Scriptures. Amen. Here's the thing. You will learn instruction from everywhere. We are always in school. And what you expose yourself to, those things will be soaked into your mind and your brain and you will either accept those things to be true and you will begin to bend your heart and your will and your emotions toward those things or you will judge those things that you hear, see, and experience by a higher authority. And I will submit that the Bible is the higher authority. Amen. He's magnified His Word above His name. So therefore, as Christians, we have to run everything past the Bible scan. Amen. That means you've got to start reading it a little bit. I will recommend a proverb a day. Today's the 15th, so you can read Proverbs 15. Tomorrow's the 16th, you read Proverbs 16. 31 chapters, you pretty much go through it every month. And then read your Bible. Learn what God says about certain things. Learn God's opinion, how God sees it, instead of just looking at it through we see it. Because can I say that sometimes we see through the wrong perception? Have you ever seen something a certain way your whole life, and then all of a sudden you, maybe you get a little older and you get a little wisdom on you and say, man, I was a dummy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man, my mom and dad knew a whole lot more than I thought they knew when I was 20 years old. Because you saw it from that perspective. You see those football coaches down on the field and you don't realize, or maybe you do, some of you, you realize there's a whole other set of coaches up there up high. <laughs> and they got their little headsets. They're watching stuff from a different perspective. So they can make some changes down on the ground. You need someone in a different perspective, the Lord Jesus Christ, in heavenly places that can make some changes on the ground to help you because you're in the middle of this. You can't really see the big picture. Our mind needs mending. So he tells us to think on the right things. Reflect, replace, redirect. If you're thinking the wrong thoughts, you have to replace those thoughts. You say, okay, I'm not going to think about uh, whatever. Uh, I just want to give you something bad to think about. I'm not going to think about beer. Okay, beer is a bad thing. You don't need to drink it. You don't need to talk about it. You don't need to think about it. But now I just said it. Now you're thinking about it. <laughs> I'm not going to. I have to be careful. If I get up here and preach on sin, I'm going to preach on sin. But I'm not going to dwell on it because your mind will dwell on it. Paul said, be simple concerning that which is evil. You don't have to go into a sewer to know it's dirty. Sin is wrong, it's bad, it's wicked. You, some of you are still thinking about beer. <laughs> you see, you've got to replace. You've got to replace. You need to read the scriptures. You need to learn some, some hymns. You need to listen to spiritual songs instead of just depressing songs. Fill your mind with the right kind of things because your behavior follows what you believe. And you believe the things that you feed your mind. Reflect, replace, redirect. The results? Peace. Peace. Uh, I don't know they have, they still have circuses, but the Walendas were the great famous tightrope walkers years and years ago and some of you Ms. Sell shaking her head she's heard the name before very famous they had like a whole family of them they passed down that that art of walking across a wire how anybody would even have think that that was fun I mean I get nervous on the end of this thing and so but anyway they have you know they got the, the whatever they call the thing they hold on to and all this but the whole secret that they always pass down is they have to find a fixed point on the other side to focus on you can't look down there at all the people moving around. You can't look at the side of the tent, the tent moving around, flopping. You can't look at your pole bouncing around. You've got to find a fixed point to walk on. You're driving down the road. You find that fixed point. You're not looking two feet in front of the vehicle. You're looking way out. You're driving a boat. You're looking way out. You have to find that fixed point. And in your mind, your fixed point is the Lord Jesus Christ. God never changes. He's absolute. He is a good God. He's always good. He always has been. He's righteous. He's holy. And God is that fixed point.
And the Scriptures are fixed. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Amen. That's a fixed point. It's like mathematics. I was mentioning this morning, some of the stuff we have, quote unquote, discovered and invented, we have just found out that they're there. They've always been there. God created them. We're just uncovering things in physics and things in mathematics and things uh, that we're understanding with technology. It's always been there. God made it. It's fixed. You just have to focus on that fixed point. You can retrain your mind. And so, as the poet William Blake said about the peril of the eye, this life's dim windows of the soul distorts the heavens from pole to pole and goads you to believe a lie when you see with and not through the eye. When you see something, you need to see through God's fixed, absolute perspectives. And the peace of God will keep your hearts. Redirect, reflect, think on the right things, things that are pure, just, holy. If it's not edifying, just discard it. There's no need to dwell on those things. You know, I don't mind sometimes these... these uh, you can have some type of movie that's maybe a, um, a movie that's uh, mystery, you know. And it'd be better if it's a mystery without murder. Everything now has got to be about death. Everything's violence. The more violent, everything sells. But some type of mystery that intrigues you and it's all made up. I don't mind that kind of stuff. But these shows where they, they go with these investigative shows about real people who were murdered and killed, that stuff is demonic. Wow. Some of you need to quit watching that, that junk. It's real people's lives. You're exploiting their life. You're trafficking through their pain by watching that stuff. People are paying for that kind of junk. And you're intrigued about how somebody killed somebody? Something's wrong. That's not... Run it by the Philippians 4.8 test or 4.7. Is it true? Is it just, you say, yeah, it's true. Okay, we'll run it through the rest of them. Just, holy, honest. Is it virtuous? Is it pure? Does it make you think about Jesus? Does it make you focus on heaven? Some of you, it's affecting your mental stability. Finally, verses 11 through 13... If you want peace instead of panic, you have to relearn some things. In verse number 11, Paul says this, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You need to relearn and retrain. How do you do that? Number one, you admit that you don't know everything. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8 verse 2, If any man think he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. You do not know everything and I do not know everything. That's the first thing. Admit it. If I'm going to relearn something, I've got to realize I might, have, I might not know it all. And then let's learn the subject of contentment. Verse number 12. Verse number 11 and verse number 12. Contentment. You're going through life, and here comes this trouble, here comes this trial. You know what? We have to deal with the new normal. Here comes this situation we're dealing with. Everybody's panicking. Okay, we just have to calibrate, make some adjustments. And Paul's writing from prison. You can tell Paul was not a 21st century American Christian. <laughs> The whole book would be whining, whining, griping, complaining. You know, how come I didn't get my check in the mail? How come I am entitled to my rights? Hey, you know, uh, just over and over and over. Paul is rejoicing. He's praying for people. He's giving some instruction. He, what a, what a testimony. We have to relearn contentment. Some of you are dealing with physical troubles in your life. And I'm not being mean this morning. I'm just going to be a preacher that tells you like it is instead of some of these who won't. I'm going to tell you some of your physical condition, it's not going to get better. I'm just being honest with you. I'm not being mean. I'm just telling you it's not always going to get better. Amen. Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in, whether I'm healthy, whether I'm sick. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. 
You might be sick, but you can still be rejoicing in Christ. You don't have to be filled with panic. You might have your finances kicked out from under you. Our country could crumble. We saw some things economically in the past few weeks that are very historic. The next few days, our whole life could change. It has changed really already, but the next few days, just like that. Peace or panic? You going to be content? Well, preacher, I really wanted it to turn out this way. I did too. Everybody wants a nice little house, a little white picket fence, and a little dog in the yard, and everything to turn out just like, you know, or down here in the south, you know, 50 acres of land and a place to take your, you know, truck mud bogging or whatever. <laughs> or a good place to hunt and fish. You know, whatever your dream is, you know. City folks, you know, a nice condominium apartment, you know. With plenty of restaurants around so you don't have to go to the grocery store and cook. Um, but we all have our ideas of contentment. But the reality is, life oftentimes does not work out the way we think it will. But there's something far greater than our own personal gain. It's His glory. And God created you for His pleasure and His glory. And He can get glory out of your life. And when you get to the place where you can give Him glory even through the sorrow, you know what? Not only is He going to get glory, but you're going to feel a whole lot better. Because that's what He made you for. And when you have peace instead of panic, and you're trusting in the Word of God no matter what happens, you know you're going to be a whole lot better testimony than a lot of these other chickens running around with their heads cut off. Because people without Jesus Christ, this is all they have. And when everything you see falls out from under you, they are literally going to lose their minds. And we have something, someone, Jesus Christ, that they need. This man, one time he put up this, this sign on a parcel of a field that he was originally selling, but then he put it up and says, look, I will give this field to one who is really contented. One applicant came to him and said, sir, I believe I'm the man for that field. I, I'd really like to have that field. And he goes, well, let me ask you, are you truly content? He goes, yes, I am. He goes, why do you want my field then? <laughs> are you content? You know, we should want the blesser, not the blessing. We should want the giver, not just the gift. We should seek for God, not just for what God grants us. I'll close with this story that I heard about and then with a verse from 2 Timothy 1. There was a family that, there was a widow lady that she had two little kids and she got sick and died. And so these two little orphan kids, they didn't have anywhere to go. So some people in their church, they basically adopted them. And they were in the transition stage of them becoming their children. They were adopting them. Everything is real raw, real fresh. It had not too long happened. Well, the family actually was at a church rehearsal for a Christmas pageant they were getting ready to do and work on, like a festival, lights type of thing. And while they were gone, their house burnt to the ground. And so here's this, this couple that's got these two kids that they've taken from this woman who passed away and they've kind of taken them. And now this little, these, these kids that are trying to find some type of uh, stability with their new family, now their home is completely burned to rubble. Well, the church got together and said, look, what can we do? And they said, well, we re really need some help this weekend trying to go through the stuff and find anything we can save. So they went through and they began to scrape through all the stuff and they found... A, a thing of papers and I believe it came from the kids mother and it had some different things like kind of like a journal and things that she had written there was this piece of paper all burned up but it had this written out it had contentment realizing that God has already provided everything we need for our present happiness and there they are with their house burnt down Contentment. God has provided everything you need. And here in this very text in Philippians chapter 4, later on toward the end of the passage, people often quote this as well. Verse number 19, he says, But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 
We have to be people of faith. You say, what is that? We believe God will take care of us. You say, well, I lost such and such and I lost such and such. He said He will provide all your need. The problem is never with God. It's always with us. It's always with how we see it. God can give you peace in the midst of panic. I'll close with this verse and we'll have a word of prayer. I'll ask our pianist to come. 2 Timothy 1 verse number 7 says this, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Rejoice, relax with requesting. Reflect those bad thoughts, redirect those bad thoughts, relearn contentment. God has got nothing has taken God by surprise. He knows the end from the beginning. And we as believers in Christ are plugged in to the right power source. If you're saved, He's inside of you. The thing we need to do is to spend time with Him so He can give us that peace that passes all understanding. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. She begins to play just a brief invitation hymn this morning. Maybe you're afraid Maybe you're going through a time personally in your life. Why don't you just make it a point this morning to start spending some time in prayer. Maybe just a short prayer. Something similar to this. Lord, I've been wrong. I've been thinking wrong. I've been consumed. And I might have even been angry. Whatever it may be, why don't you just confess that to the Lord and talk to the Lord about it. Simple prayer, God, please help me. God, I want your peace. I want your calm instead of fear. The song she's playing says, Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Some of you, you've gone to all these other sources trying to find peace. All these other places. You're talking to all these other people instead of Jesus.